So I guess it's tradition to start with this clip when you talk about I, so uh, here you go. Hey everybody, I know some of you have been asking for this for quite a while. Today we're going to take a look at an immersive sim that isn't necessarily an obscure game so much as it's an infamous one thanks to its extremely out there design and how it essentially came from nowhere and was made by people who had no connections to developers that usually make immersive sims. Yep, we're talking about I, Divine Cybermancy. So check the status of your legs and buckle up. As a fair warning to all of you watching right now, this game is not for everyone. And even if it is for you, it takes a bit to get into. There is a part of this where I'll talk about how you can get past all the bumps and blemishes in I at the Mark timestamp, which if you think you might want to try out I someday, I cannot recommend this methodology enough. I, Divine Cybermancy, is a first-person shooter RPG that fits easily into the category of immersive sim by virtue of your ability to solve problems pretty much however you want to solve them, and some of those potential solutions can get pretty wild. I sports some of the most impressive gunplay out of all the games that can be called immersive sims, but it also has some of the worst game design and hard to follow stories of all the immersive sims, leading to I being memed about for its ridiculous a lot more than it's actually being played. Heck, I'd say that if it wasn't for Underworld Ascendant, I would be the worst immersive sim out there, but even I is several orders of magnitude better than UA. Yet at the same time, I is in a way one of the most memorable immersive sims and by extension one of the most memorable video games out there for the sheer amount of crazy stuff that it does and the stuff that it lets you do, which somehow makes it one of the best immersive sims I played at the same time. So who made this oddity? The answer is a group of modders in France calling themselves Strumon Studio, which a French person in the comments of the Big M Sim video told me is a wordplay on the word monstre, which apparently saying things backwards is a cool thing to do in France. Regardless of the actual semantics though, Strum made a total conversion mod for Half-Life called Syndicate Black Ops before making I, and between those two they tried to make another game in Unreal that just didn't pan out. Nowadays they're known for making the new version of Space Hulk Deathwing, which makes a lot of sense considering that if you've played I, you'd notice that at best it's heavily, heavily inspired by Warhammer 40k, and sometimes I's story is just overtly 40k that uses undiluted paints to cover up the serial numbers. I was coming along okay for the most part, but then Stremon found an investor which meant that they had to get the game out the door like a big boy game dev, only for I to get middling to low review scores, citing that while there was a lot of interesting and even ambitious stuff in I, there was also a lot of poor game design and jank in I that made it a real challenge for people to enjoy the game, and I gotta be honest here, that's right on the money. So the best place to start when talking about I is the character creation screen. You don't start with a new save so much as you create a new character profile that will be used in both single player and multiplayer sessions because that's just how I rolls. Progress on your tune is kept between all sessions, allowing you to level up outside of the campaign, but we'll talk about that later after we talk about hitting the wall. Rather than pick up from a series of classes, you're made to choose three genetic traits that are all so soaked in flavor text it's entirely reasonable for you to have no idea what kind of character you're building. Just look at the green and red numbers and you'll do fine. Don't worry too much about this page, as you'll level up frequently enough to correct any shortcomings you find yourself having later on, and your totally not gene seed is never relevant again after this page. Your class will even change at the end of every level depending on where your points are allocated, so outside of that, class is meaningless. Next comes gearing your guy up, which is done at these mobile armories peppered about everywhere, and you'll be able to equip your character with pretty much whatever you want them to have, save for the high-end items that you need to research or buy. You'll learn fairly quickly that the starting weapons are rock solid, and no one would fault you for using them through all of your playthroughs. You'll have lots of fun learning how each weapon handles, and how you go down in like a hit and a half with light armor, so just take the speed penalty. About that, movement speed is directly affected by two things, your agility stat and how much stuff you're carrying. You can carry and equip pretty much anything you want, and it's actually pretty hard to hit the carry limit in I, but the real penalty is that the more stuff you're carrying, heavier armor included, the heavier of a debuff you get on your move speed. Carrying a full loadout is gonna make you run slower than most people walk early on, which wouldn't be so bad, except for the levels in I are fuck off huge. 
like hell. I'd love to take it all in if it wasn't for how I've got places to be. To make matters even worse, it's very hard to get around an eye and you'll frequently find yourself getting lost in the levels, meaning that you're gonna have to backtrack all the way you came. You're gonna frequently be finding yourself frustrated and wondering aloud why all these levels are so stinking huge when you move as fast as you move, but eventually you're gonna find a setup that works for you. In the meantime, let's talk about guns, gear, and stuff. So the variety of guns in this game is nuts for a title so small, and there's three or four unique versions of every type of weapon that all act in their own way. No weapon is a one-size-fits-all approach to combat, and each and every gun has its strengths and weaknesses. Take the starting assault rifle, for instance. It's got great range and stopping power, and when you toggle it to single shot, you've got a DMR that'll let you do counter sniper work while still being able to clear out the bad guys at medium range. But once you get within inside voices range, it becomes near useless as it's hard to handle in close quarters, and when enemies get too close to you to properly aim your weapon, it just won't fire, and instead you'll do this force push thing that eats up your psi power. Lucky for you, the starting pistol has the opposite strengths, where it hits like a truck at close quarters, but it's very hard to aim past 10 meters. Then there's the heavy sniper rifle, which is great for taking out gunships and the totally not cyber demons from over a kilometer away, but is a death sentence in any other situation, as the recoil on this thing makes it handle like it's made out of rubber. And yes, there is the fuller auto gun you saw in the Mandalore video. At this point, I'm fairly certain Fuller Auto was meant as a novelty, as while the starting SMG can do a pretty good job of clearing multiple soft targets at close range, despite being a bit hard to handle at times, once you switch it into Fuller Auto, it becomes nigh impossible to aim, and its effective range is so short that by the time the enemy gets within close enough for your bullets to actually hit them, you'll most likely do the force push ability anyway. And these are just the starting weapons. You'll eventually get the crazy stuff like the Bear Killer Revolver that hits harder and faster than the previously mentioned heavy sniper, and the literal nuke cannon, which was basically the devs at Stroman going, Woohoo! Hey, what if we took the fat man from Fallout 3 and made it into a semi-auto gun? What about other methods of ending another's life without the use of spooky removal devices or psi abilities? Well, it wouldn't be a 40k alike without the ability to wield a massive cyber sword in all situations. You'll always have your default sword, which is basically, in case you run out of literally all your ammo, press 1, and you can kill stuff with this glorified steak knife, but it's going to be far less than ideal. Then you've got your fast set of double katanas, the off-brand lightsaber that not only kills things, but straight up explodes multiple dudes in one swing. Oh, and there's also a giant warhammer that costs as much as a crappy townhome in Newport Beach that has bug stat requirements too. I almost went for this thing, except I realized that I'd be grinding for research drops for all eternity if I wanted it, so I passed. But then I went and unlocked it anyway. Lastly, we got stuff. Stuff is a med kit that you can OD on if you're not careful. Totally not the grenades from Half-Life 2. Totally not the deployable turrets from Half-Life 2 and the servo skull, which only seems to be effective when other people are using it against me. So every mission will start with you at a spot in front of a mobile armory, and then you'll be given a set of objectives. Usually for each mission, there's a core goal that you have to do every time, but outside of that, objectives are randomly assigned to you, meaning that you'll end up doing a lot of different things between playthroughs. One time I got the totally not Space Hulk mission when I went to the looter base. One time the doors were already sealed. One time I was ordered to go and sabotage the drinking supply at the looter base. Another time I was to figure out who the heck was poisoning the looter's drinking supply. Heck, one time I was ordered to go poison the water supply and then immediately investigate who the heck was poisoning the water supply. I kind of had a hunch who did it. Part of the reason why I think I had such a hard time finding walkthroughs on I to make sure I was on the right track for the true ending, despite the game being nearly 10 years old now, is because the contents of missions can vary so much from player to player and between playthroughs. So when you're not committing false flag operations or using space wizard powers to pull off some really wild stuff, you'll be in your sanctum. Temple HQ. If you're in a hurry, just talk to Rimina and be on your merry way to the next mission, but it's nice to stop and see what's going on out there, you know, chat up your mentor, see what your buddy from the Geons has learned about the monsters this time, eh, just see what's up, really. When you first come down here, your boss will tell you to go check up on your history in the archives since you can't seem to remember anything, and when you get there, there is indeed a full-blown library full of lore for you to explore. Strumon went all out on this, but unfortunately it's a little hard to read at times since 
since everything's in a really small text box with no real formatting aside from it almost always being in one big block of text at a time, and the game is sparsely voice acted, and what little voice acting there is is spoken in some sort of strange sci-fi language I can't suss out. There's still lots to explore here, and you can take advantage of the firing rings to check out new weapons, you can go to the upgrade store to see just how much getting a new kit will cost, and other stuff like talking to weirdos. Outside of missions and buying stuff at the Sanctum, the main way you're going to be getting stuff is research. Enemies will drop suspicious looking briefcases when they die, and when you pick them up, you'll be given a new artifact to research. Now, some of these are pretty rare, and you might not even see them on your first or even your fifth or sixth go round through the story unless you know how to farm drops, whereas you'll come across others two or three times casually playing a single mission. Once you have the required artifact, you go down to the research menu, decide how much of your money you want to allocate to figuring out what this thing is, and then it all goes on in the background while you're shooting at looters and feds. Some of these range from relatively minor things that cost small amounts of change, such as the med kit, to crazy endgame stuff that costs an insane amount of cash to fund, even if you want to do it the slow way, and then it's going to take an in-game month. It's cool though, because all research goes on no matter where you are or what you're doing, so long as you're in the game, so you can just leave the game running in the temple and then go make yourself some lunch or something. Then you've got the good stuff. The Psy Abilities. Psy Abilities cost a pretty penny to get, and how well they're gonna work, if they work at all, is entirely dependent on how high your Psy skill is. As a point of reference, depending on your Psy skill, the starting Polyclone ability can give you a paltry three low-level dudes carrying dinky little pistols towards the start of the game, or if you invest a lot of points into your Psy skill, it'll summon five heavily armored dudes with endgame weapons that can clear rooms without you having to lift a finger. But wait, there's more. The Cyber Jump ability that you start with can also be enhanced, to where you go from being able to just clear minor ledges to essentially flying across the map. And we're not even into the crazy stuff yet, like exploding a dude into a monster or all the crazy stuff you can do with telekinesis. Then if that wasn't enough for you, there's hacking. You can hack anything in this game. And if that wasn't enough already, there's different ways you can hack everything in this game from say, taking it over, making it self-destruct, seeing through another person's eyes, making dudes go berserk and then have them do the killing for you, or you'll screw up and get hacked yourself and get chucked into the stratosphere. Leveling up is fairly straightforward as if you're ever having an issue with later game missions, you can respond to the sanctum where you can go and take side missions that are fairly easy and are usually just go kill all the dudes in this place, which the place just happens to be one of the multiplayer maps. Or if that's not enough for you, you can straight up reroll missions you've played earlier in the game with a new set of objectives. Just be warned though, without the main plot quest to keep things focused, those missions can take way longer than they did the first time around. And if you ever see that your objective is to either protect something or to disable a bunch of things, just go ahead and restart. So let's go over why I isn't nearly as popular as Deus Ex, the shot games, or other immersive sims. A lot of folks love to praise I for its aesthetic, insane gameplay innovations, and the out there story, but let's all be honest with ourselves here. I got panned by critics for a reason, and while we all love to meme about I, it's been a long time since any of us actually played it, or even played it with a fresh character instead of just dusting off our level 108 old reliable. There's a lot of stuff that's just genuinely bad game design here, and if I had to call it, I'd say that a lot of this is the result of trying to directly translate tabletop mechanics into a first person action game with disastrous results. This game has a lot of complicated stuff thrown at you right out of the gate, and while I does come with over 20 tutorial videos to try and explain what you need to do for certain things, I found that these videos were vague at best and real mastery came through trial and error. And while they do prompt you to watch these tutorial videos in the early areas, it's only a few times and the rest of them are things you might not even think to look up until you figured it out already. I can be about as clear as a brick wall if you're going in blind, and after several playthroughs of this for video reasons, sometimes I got the feeling that Strumon was operating as if the player would have a core book handy that you'd have read extensively before even starting the game. If that wasn't bad enough already, the difficulty curve is more like the difficulty cliff. Things will be fine during your first mission or so, if not at least a little bit frustrating as you'll have more weapons than you really need, so it'll be tedious getting around the big old levels. Especially when you realize that that thing you needed is on the other side of the map and you took a wrong turn at the part of the level where it looks like you can get over there, but actually it's totally inaccessible from the path you took so now you have to backtrack. Then. Right around the not Space Hulk level, you start feeling the pain. Let's talk about how enemies spawn. 
Enemies will spawn from the nearest spawn point that you aren't immediately looking at. And while you can tune the spawn rate a little bit, you'll never truly clear an area. Enemy spawns aren't monster closets. They're monster clown cars, and you'll get bum rushed out of nowhere by like five or six guys who don't care that you're running low on ammo and they just came into existence. It feels like the default setting was meant for multiplayer co-op, and you'll find yourself running out of a means to deal with baddies fast early on in the game. Then there's certain enemies that can effectively one-shot you before you even see them. Turrets, some snipers, gunships that definitely aren't reskin gunships from Half-Life 2, and the not cyber demon. While the snipers aren't too bad so long as you catch them fast, the gunships and not cyber demons are tough as nails and unless you want to carry around the very situational weapon like the heavy sniper or later on the bear killer if you're willing to spec into it, you're otherwise going to have to blow a lot of your ammo you brought for the ever respawning hordes of soldiers and not warp demons on taking down a gunship that can one shot you. And if that wasn't bad enough, all the enemies are on the respawn timer, which means that just as you barely take down those two not cyber demons on Mars and head to where you need to go? Oh no! You couldn't see over the horizon for about eight seconds while running towards the federal base and that not cyber demon you spent all your ammo taking down that was standing between you and the path to the base respawned right in front of you. Even better yet, you turned around to face that cyber demon that just spawned in front of you and then the other one that was nearby the portal respawned too. And you can hear the noises of the gunships that you were barely able to take down three minutes ago coming closer to you. Everything is pain forever. Now let's talk about some mechanics I didn't initially cover in part one that belong here because while one of them or the other might be fine in another game, the two paired together in this game make for a very bad time. Resurrectors and the Fatal Wound System. So how it works on paper is that every time you start your session, you get a set amount of Resurrectors, essentially extra lives. You start out with nine, but if you upgrade your cybernetics, sky's the limit. When you die, you will get respawned to exactly where you were about 10 seconds seconds later, so long as you're in a place where you can continue playing. Then, there's the Fatal Wound system, in which you'll get a permanent stat debuff if you die too frequently. It's based on your Karma stat, which you can literally repair, but there's always a chance of getting one, and you'll find out how fast they can stack. Now, both of these would be fine, except that when you pair these together with the clown car spawning and the fact that there are a lot of near indestructible one-shot kill enemies who will respawn inside of a minute, you've got yourself a problem. You see, while you'll get a few seconds of invincibility per res, it often isn't going to be nearly enough time to get clear of enemies, and the game doesn't care that you died because you were out of ammo or something, or got swarmed by the totally not warp demons. You just respawn right where you were, right as you were, rather than in a safe spot. It is entirely possible, and even likely, that you'll suffer consecutive deaths in the same spot, and eventually wipe out back to the strange area, thanks to the resurrection system, and you'll rack up a bunch of fatal wounds in the process. So now, on top of having a very bad time because you weren't prepared for the bum rushing and all the insane stuff that I throws at you, now you've got a ton of stat debuffs that essentially make you go back a few levels. But the game doesn't care because you must suffer the cycles of guilt eternally and feel maximum pain at all times. Okay, it's been about three pages of talking about eyes issues, so I'm going to pretend I heard one of you shout your safe word and take a little pause here. Part of the reason why I'm being so hard on all of eyes defects is because a lot of people love to extol eye for how wild and cool it is, which gets people who haven't played it all excited about the game, and then they go and buy it. But then they actually play it having no idea what they're getting into. They get as far as maybe the looter base or their first trip to Mars, if they're dedicated, but then they drop the game to never touch it again after having a terrible time, and they think all immersive sims are like that since I is so heavily ingrained with immersive sims. A good place to see this marker is looking at the Steam Achievements page for like global stats and seeing how many people get the easiest achievement in the game, which is something you'll most likely do out of curiosity on the first level, versus how many people get as far as making it past their first trip to Mars, or even further, getting the achievement for making it to the true end. To help you understand why I'm being so thorough with all the detracting elements of I, let's take a look at what you get when you search up I on YouTube. The first thing you'll see is Mandalore's video, which does do a pretty good job of trying to warn the viewer that this game isn't for everyone, 
In fact, I believe he says it at both the beginning and the end. And some of the stuff I've talked about in this section probably sounds pretty familiar right about now if you've seen that video. Manny does a pretty good job at warning people about some of the things you should expect when playing I, but doesn't linger too long as one of the video's strengths is its brevity. And that leaves out a few things, which at least in my opinion, are things you should know about if you want to get into I. Then there's Remy's video, which shows off a lot of the worst elements of I, but doesn't really explain the issues or even put those bad moments into context so a lot of people got angry, chalked it up to being a montage of bad moments taken out of context for YouTube funnies, and then wrote off the video. It probably doesn't help things that Remy doubles down on his negative opinion of I in both the description and the comments of that video. He also says that he never saw the Mandalore video and was suggested I by a friend. Remy's experience is the kind that so many get when you go into I completely unprepared and as you can see he and his friends had a terrible time. A good parallel to draw is if your friend told you about this movie they love to watch, Tommy Wiseau's The Room. But they didn't explain to you that they love it because it's a so bad it's good type of situation and when you try to watch it for yourself you get confused frustrated, and you think your friend has played a prank on you. Finally, there's this third video, which I have to say is really good, and I would suggest anyone who wants to get into I watch it as it's extremely helpful. In fact, much more so than the in-game tutorial videos. However, it doesn't warn you about some of the issues you're going to face trying to play the game, which, to be fair, isn't what that video set out to do. I'm going to try and be brief with the rest of this and tell you how you can alleviate nearly all of these issues so that you can enjoy I divine cybermancy to the fullest if you choose to play it. Okay, back to the pain! The hacking minigame is by far the worst hacking minigame out of all the immersive sims and by extension all of video games. Yes, the results of hacking are some of the best, if not the best in video games, but doing the hacking is like pulling teeth and Omni Saya help you if you get to the level where you need to protect Dutch without putting any points into hacking. Never mind that attempting hacks in the later game will not only get your own stupid brain hacked, but also has a chance of blowing one of your resurrectors. I'm frankly not surprised in the slightest that Remy's video ends at the door to get into the old eye base, as that's where my own playthrough nearly ended because I didn't put any points into hacking because up until then, hacking was something that was entirely optional in the game. Now I'm going to present the solution to almost all the issues you'll encounter in your first playthrough of I, which ironically comes out of I's jank, power leveling. So if you're having issues with I's crazy spawn rate, stat debuffs from dying too much, and other things that were probably better on pen and paper than they were in video game, here's what you do. First off, get to Mars, the CM Noctis map. You don't have to beat it, you just have to get there. Turn the difficulty and respawn rates all the way down if you have to. Just get there. Once you reach Noctis, you'll unlock it for multiplayer. Create a multiplayer game, turn the difficulty and respawn rates all the way up, but lower the AI settings because that doesn't count for experience gain. Set the match to private or password it. When you launch the map, go into the armory and equip heavy armor, the middle sniper with all the ammo you can physically carry, and nothing else. Take the second from the right teleporter into the area where the not cyber demons are fighting the not Half-Life 2 gunships and just start going to town on them. They'll be scripted to fight each other so they won't immediately attack you and you'll have just enough time to take down one or two of them before running back through the portal and doing it again. After you get the first group done, you'll be able to hang out in that area as the not cyber demons and gunships respawn and you'll also be able to clear out the soldiers running at you from the canyon no problem. Why and how this works is that the not cyber demons and gunships are the highest XP and bros of dropping enemies in the game and how much money and XP you earn is directly related to the difficulty setting. Now, in order to get cash from something dying, you have to be the one that deals the killing blow. However, experience is awarded by damage dealt instead of enemies kills, meaning that you don't need to kill all the beasties, you just need to rack up damage on them. Doing this for half an hour will net you more experience and bros of than the entire campaign and best of all, once you clear out all the big baddies, you can start running up and down the canyon nearby, not only to respawn them in order to make power living go faster, but also you can farm research drops by killing the soldiers, particularly the very rare medical artifact, which is the key to getting rid of all of those fatal wounds. This will get even easier to do as you start leveling up, as you'll likely get the skill points you need for the BK444 hand cannon, which is just as powerful and accurate as the sniper, however it handles way better and takes up much less weight. Keep blasting gunships and not cyber demons until you're at least level 30 or so, and then go back to playing the campaign wherever you left off. Oh, and for those of you that skipped to the
the timestamp, go to this timestamp to watch the video normally. Unfortunately, there's one thing that power leveling can't fix though, and that is the massive amount of jank in I Divine Cybermancy. Things that aren't so much bad design as they are bad coding. For starters, the scripting is a hot mess in I that will frequently leave you restarting levels after an hour because a quest important character doesn't feel like talking to you so you can't finish the main quest and get to the next level. Or sometimes the game forgets to make you temporarily invincible during set pieces, like during that one part of the intro segment where you slide down to the bottom of the drainage canal and instead of feeling like an ultra badass, you just die when you hit the bottom unless you're in heavy armor and have cyber legs 5. If that wasn't bad enough, sometimes vital characters don't even spawn in at all in the end game and you'll be forced to replay not only all the final levels of your chosen ending, but also you'll have to replay all of Mars in order to make the choice you want for your ending, unless you just want to go ahead and finish the game without getting the Psy ability you need for the true ending, necessitating an entire extra playthrough to get it and then get to the true end. Then there's how this game is always online, but not really. I functions like a co-op multiplayer game that just happens to let you play the campaign solo if your buddies aren't online. It'll always say that the game is retrieving server info or whatever, like it's connecting to a server to play, but I check this by unplugging my router before starting up the game and all the levels load in just fine when you're playing single player. The real issue comes from how you can't use any console commands and single player based exploits, like say, no clipping yourself out of a place where you get stuck or manually prompting quest flags when your mentor glitches out and forgets how to talk to you. And instead of getting the result you need to get around this game's poor scripting, you'll get a message in the console calling you a very bad nasty cheater. So now on top of having to restart the level you spent an hour in thanks to poor scripting or getting trapped in a well, the game is now chastising you for trying to get yourself out of that situation without losing all your progress. Lastly, there's the AI which is very much just Half-Life 2's AI, which doesn't work very well in big maps like Eyes. It's not all hunt down the Freeman levels of bad which does the same thing as I, but all the enemies know is that if you're in range of the player, shoot at them. If not, try to get into the range of the player by shortest path possible. There are a few exceptions to this, like on Mars, where the gunships are fighting the not cyber demons, which I think is scripted, but you'll notice that the looters and feds will march alongside one another to charge at you since HL2 AI doesn't really do multiple factions all that well, which if you haven't guessed it already, your psychic polyclones are essentially the rebels from Half-Life 2 in all their goofy glory. Don't get too worried about all of this though, as eventually you'll become the master of Eyes jank with enough practice. So you just barely survived your first playthrough, and let's be honest with ourselves here, you almost dropped die after losing all your resurrectors on Mars and getting booted back to the escort quest four times. But you grinded it out in Seam Noctis and you made it. Don't worry about the subsequent playthroughs and making it to the true end that you only know about thanks to the Mandalore Gaming video. While my first playthrough took me 16 hours, my second took less than four and was a lot more fun than the first time around. And it was only that long since I kept taking breaks to eat my lunch. While the second and even third playthrough won't be entirely jank free, you're going to have a lot better of a time than you did with your first playthrough. Things are going to start getting a little smoother as you start to understand the game and then it happens. You begin to believe. I know the Matrix reference here is a little on the nose, but it fits perfectly. At some point during your replays, it'll eventually just click. You'll stop playing I like a normal shooter game that happens to have magic adjacent abilities and a lot of jank, and you'll start playing it like it's meant to be played. You no longer bother with any gun other than the BK-444, and you only keep that around for the occasional gunship that you don't feel like jumping on top of. Traversing the map is no longer an issue, and you don't even bother with buffing your agility anymore, because your primary method of travel is telefragging across the map, and sometimes Jedi Masters will fantasize about having powers like you. You've gone from just barely squeaking by on easy mode with reduced spawns, to having difficulty and respawn ranks cranked all the way up, so that there's no shortage of bad guys for you to do crazy Psy attacks on. The big maps and missions are now just jungle gyms for you to see how ridiculously high you can jump and if you really wanted to you could probably complete each mission inside of a minute or so but you're having too much fun. This right here 
This is why people speak so highly of I, Divine Cybermancy. Once you climb that sheer cliff of a difficulty curve and stand atop the summit, you will see all the ridiculous stuff you can do, and now you understand the game. So now that we're no longer trying to keep our blood pressure down while getting through the game, we can talk about the lore a bit. I'm just gonna come out and say it. I is Warhammer 40,000 with a serial number shaved off, which oddly enough didn't result in the usual reaction from Games Workshop, but instead they let Stremon make the latest iteration of Space. Hulk. I takes place in the dark future of mankind, where technology has advanced so much that we've lost track of a lot of it and now consider a good amount of it to just be straight up magic. At some point, things got out of hand with all the pain and suffering, which brought on an otherworldly energy called the Metastremonic Force, which manifested in reality as a bunch of scary demon things. A super secret organization called the Secreta Secretorum formed I out of two already existing humanity defense forces, and once that started going well, they decided to try and use I to take control of the government. It didn't go so well, and things got so bad that the totally not warp demons reappeared worse than ever before after the coup failed, so now everyone has to deal with the fallout from the insurrection and an overwhelming tide of otherworldly monsters. About 70% of humanity has died thanks to this. To make matters even worse, the two factions that make up I, the Coulter Day and the Jian Sheng Di, are now feuding. This is really, really glossing over a lot of things here, but if you're familiar with 40k stuff and how out there it can get sometimes, a lot of this will come pretty easy to you. Hell, there's some stuff here that's just 40k and everything but name. So you fit into all of this in the form of being a member of the Culture Day, who starts in a dream state where he sees the dead body of his mentor and remarks that while he did kill him, he is not his mentor's murderer. He then wakes up in a cave after a botched mission with no memories, but your boys get a hold of you and help you get back to Temple HQ. Once there, your mentor scolds you for your indiscretion, and then your personal not a servo skull gives you a message from yourself telling you that something is afoot. Then you meet your commander, who explains to you that part of your botched mission is to subvert and eventually get rid of your mentor, as the commander wants to eliminate the Jians once and for all, so that I can focus on picking up where they left off with overthrowing the Federation. Your mentor, on the other hand, wants to unite the two factions of I. You go on a series of missions where your mentor will occasionally subvert the commander to his own ends, but then again, all the stuff you do before the final mission is your commander using you to subvert his own bosses so he can try and take down the Jean. Things come to a head after the Cold War between the Secreta and the Federation heats up on Mars over the possession of an artifact that may just hold the secrets of the universe in it. Here the player can choose if he wants to follow the commander to take down his mentor and the Jians, or if he wants to help his mentor by outing the Federal spies in I and taking down the commander, or if he wants to say screw you to all of I and just join the Federation outright. You'll get a super special Psy power for each ending you complete, so long as the game remembers to spawn in the character who gives it to you. And no matter who you choose to side with, it'll end with you returning to the temple to find that no one has inhabited the office where you took your orders from your commander for years now and that people are starting to get weirded out by you. There's a few people who also notice that something seems to be very wrong with space time here and you'll eventually be directed to where you confronted your commander to find that the big portal is now open. When you go through it, you're greeted by a mysterious entity and the apparitions of your commander and mentor who will tell you that things are not as they seem before you go through the portal again and find that you've woken up in that cave all over again where the botched mission went down. Welcome to New Game Plus. Okay, big spoiler time, but 90% of you already know this. It turns out that you, your commander, and your mentor are all the same person trapped in a spiritual purgatory called the Cycles of Guilt, forced to repeat the same actions over and over again that represent the inner conflict between your actions and your personality. Apparently, this was brought on by you being forced to punish your wife for exploring the secrets below Temple HQ, which resulted in her death by torture. This is also why the cynical demon chooses to take the form of a woman who apparently resembles your wife. However, you are so overcome with grief that you are prevented from remembering too much about her. In the end, you enter a portal in the cave where this all started, and all of this was revealed to you and you're given the option to either continue the cycles of grief to seek greater understanding or to break the cycle, which leads to a more literal purgatory. I did some digging and apparently there was originally a different version of the true ending that explained a lot more, but the guys at Stromon were strapped for time so they went with this. This is all kind of iffy though as the wiki page that talks about this cites a forum post without actually linking to the forum post, so we'll never know unless Stromon decides to elaborate on this. Once upon a time, this ending was much, much harder to get, as that stat you see on the end mission screen, 
your position on Clatum's ladder was also a contributing factor in if you were able to experience the true ending or not. Your rank on Clatum's ladder is heavily dependent on how much research you complete per level and the amount of backstabs you do, which could make getting the number one position you'd need on all the levels hard, if not impossible to achieve thanks to how some levels are laid out. Strumon noticed that no one was making it to the true end, so they got rid of this and now Clatum's ladder is entirely vestigial. Seriously, thank God they did though, or else I would have never been able to get here myself. So why do we still love I despite all the flaws I pointed out in this video that seemingly might outweigh all the crazy stuff you're able to do eventually after you put 30 hours into a 15 hour game? Sure, the story is novel and out there, but it's very hard to find in all the small text boxes and happenstance encounters. And the open-ended gameplay is great, only so long as you become a master of navigating I's many, many glitches and bad design aspects. Well, for starters, I is a genuinely unique experience, and not only all the stuff I've mentioned before, but also how every part of this game can be played in full-blown co-op. That's right, you and 23 of your bros can storm Mars together with crazy space ninja psychic magic. Heck, that's how I first learned about I back in 2013 when I was invited along to a stream where we all played I together, but couldn't get past the first level as people kept attacking NPCs in Temple HQ, resulting in a mission failure. There's also a straight-up deathmatch mode, which is fun in and of itself, but not really why we're here. Then there's how thanks to I being a Source Engine game, it's very easy for people to make custom maps and campaigns, including the very, very handy CM Sermon, which is a must have if you actually want to complete the tech tree. Seriously, I thought my game was bugged until I looked up the drop rates on certain artifacts to find that it took some people over 80 hours of grinding to get everything they needed and literally tens of thousands of enemies killed to get a certain four items to drop. Veterans of I, know exactly which four items they are. Then there's the memes that came from I. Wacky stuff like the status of your legs being paramount or the over the top critical fail notifications make up for a hammy time that you just, you can't get anywhere else. Uh, at least you can't get anywhere else while you're telefragging space troopers. I related memes are great for seeing who also enjoys over the top video games. And it's almost like the Wakali would of video games in a way, which now that I think of it, I really want a video game adaptation of who killed Captain Alex. Then there's the setting of I and how no one else quite does cyberpunk like I does it, with big, expansive cities that are empty on purpose thanks to the widespread destruction of humanity at the hands of the Ministrumonic Force. Sure, the graphics themselves aren't the best, but the aesthetic is to die for an I once you get past the hump of having to move slowly through those massive maps. There was also how, for a while, I was the closest you could get to the Space Marine experience. Well, until Warhammer 40,000 Space Marine came out quite literally two months later. But then again, that was more of an action romp compared to I's insane psi builds and surreal space adventure and a grim dark humanity. At the end of the day, once you get into it, there's nothing quite like I that lets you do as much as I lets you do was as crazy of a story. And when you think about it, it becomes so tragic how some of Strumon's vision is clearly realized in I, but thanks to inexperience, a lack of resources and general constraint, what was ultimately put out was something that got panned by critics and only shown love in select circles by people with extraordinary patience to get through the rough parts of the game to enjoy the good stuff. So, with all that being said, is I worth your time? That's a pretty hard question, really, since the first 20 hours or so of I are very, very rough, and you'll need to weigh the pain of slugging through the bad parts against the joy of what happens when you begin to truly understand how to have a good time in I, and if that joy is even worth it to you in the first place. For some, that's going to be a hard pass, and I think nothing less of those people. It took me a lot of tries to get far enough to where I could do all the crazy, stupid stuff in the latter part of the game, and I nearly called it quits after the first playthrough of this video, and I'll gladly admit that the first 20 hours of I are some of the worst experiences in gaming I've ever had, while the latter half of I is some of the best times I've ever had playing a game. Part of the reason why I made this video is to give I a fair shake, which includes going over the insane amount of jank and bad game design that's present in I. If you're willing to accept that in the name of having a genuinely unique experience, go for it. People like to heavily downplay just how bad I can get, which results in a lot of the previously mentioned swaths of people getting into I after hearing it hyped up, only to quit and never touch it again at around the looter base or so. The other day when I tweeted about I, an old friend asked me about it and when I 
said that the first 20 hours were terrible and it starts to get good after hour 30 or so, he balked at me and frankly, I can't blame him one bit. If you do want to give I a try, I can't recommend enough watching that one video I talked about earlier as it does a far better job of explaining things than the in-game tutorials do. And then being ready to do some serious grinding once you get to the right point in the campaign so that things will go much smoother on subsequent playthroughs. I can't recommend enough using the Noctis Labyrinth map to get up to the level you need to be. And then once you hit the wall researching, download the Sermons map, which I'll include a link to in the description. At the end of the day, I is 10 bucks on Steam, and once you scale that difficulty cliff, it'll give you dozens of chaos-filled hours of entertainment. Not to mention that it becomes an entirely different kind of fun when you've got three or four other psychic space ninjas along for the ride instead of it just being you. There's a lot of worse things you could spend your Dogecoin profits on. And that's gonna do it for today. Sorry for no anti-sponsor cooking segment, but they just didn't fit the flow of the video. I'll have a cooking segment for you in the next video come early March and maybe an anti-sponsor too. The next video is gonna be like the Kenshi one. Speaking of which, I have no idea when I'm gonna find the time to do it, but enough of you have asked for a sequel to that video that I can't not make it. But first, I've got a really big project that I'm working on that if all goes as planned, I'll have out towards the end of the year after Indie Ween 2021 is taken care of. Big thanks to all the patrons and shout out to $10 patrons Bam Bam Toxico, Carl with a K, Chili Moon Buns, Danger Guy, Destitute, Douglas Back, Forbidden Snack, Nice Shorts, Jason Breen, John K, McFluffers, Niles D, Elisa Nera, Paul Mackey, Richard Hughes, Schlingding, Sisyphan, So D, Turtle, Technica, Torhacken, Yannick Z, Degnegator, and Epic Fail. Whew, it, I really, it's uh, been a while since I've been able to properly do that, but it's just so much fun. In the meantime, stay safe, stay indoors, wash your hands and wear a mask, practice social distancing when you need to go out and enjoy this cat video. He just, he sees me picking it up and he knows. Wait, why are you going over there? That's not where the laser is. Mister. Oh, are you gonna get it? <laughs> he will only, <laughs> oh, are you, okay, you're not stuck. He will only attack it from the safety of behind my bathrobe. You're not gonna go over here and get it? You're not gonna go over here? You gonna go on daddy's mat? Gotta get it, gotta get it. With this. Oh, you know what this is. Oh. You ran right past it, you silly.